Konnichiwa, everyone. My name is James Faulkner. Uh, I work at Red Hat. I've been at Red Hat for about seven years, and I focus on technical products management and marketing for our hybrid platform products like OpenShift and uh, JBoss, our application development platform, um, and a number of components on top of that. So with me today is Daniel. Daniel, want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm working for Red Hat, like James Faulkner, and then uh, same team. I'm a developer advocate and also CNCF ambassador. So pretty much focus on Kubernetes and serverless and service mesh, as well as the container runtime and like a cloud name runtime, like a Java, JavaScript, and, and so on. So we are more than happy to be here today, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, for the next 30 minutes around the open telemetry, how to make a better experience, and then around the open telemetry with the server list, and then specifically Java application. I'm going to hand it over back to James. Thank you, Daniel. So I'll speak for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then Daniel has a demo to showcase how open telemetry can solve a very important problem for Java developers um, in the world of cloud native computing. So here's pictures of Daniel and myself and our uh, Twitter handles. Uh, that picture on the right is me, uh, a few pounds lighter, a few more hairs uh, in, uh, in Kamakura, south of here in 2002. That was my first time I worked at Sun Microsystems and I was able to visit the, the country. This is my fourth time in Japan. Um, and so really happy to be here today uh, to speak to all of you. Thank you all for coming. I know I'm competing with a uh, keynote speaker from earlier this morning, so thank you for that. Um, so I want to get right into it and talk about observability. I don't want to step off the edge here. Um, so what is observability? Uh, you know, from the, from the English word, it means you can see something, right? You can observe it, but it also means that you can understand it and you can draw conclusions and you can understand what you're, what you're seeing and, and you know, kind of process it in your mind, right? Um, it's really important to be able to do that in software as well. Um, since the beginning of, of the industry, um, we really need to understand the systems that we build so that we can improve them and make them safer and more, you know, compliant in, in some cases and, and better and more efficient. Um, so observability is super critical. One of the challenges in observability is knowing what you are going to possibly ask in the future before the time comes to ask that question. And so, Observability um, is really more about capturing as much as possible uh, with, it, with certain constraints and not limiting yourself to one specific angle or one specific facet of your system. Because if you only look at that one facet, you're only going to, be going to be able to draw conclusions based on limited data, right? So observability is, not, is trying not to define the questions up front, but more important, defining the, the types of data that you can collect, that you can observe, um, and doing something in interesting with that. So this challenge also exists outside of the world of software. Um, one example recently um, is this. So you may recognize this. Um, so according to this picture, the ball was clearly out, and Japan should not have scored that goal, right? Because you got like, I don't know, a good few centimeters of green there. Right? If you only look at this one angle, this only one piece of, si of signal, you're going to draw, hopefully, well, not hopefully, but you're going to draw the wrong conclusion, right? So having more angles and being able to observe multiple different facets of your system can help you infer a more correct or more accurate conclusion. Um, so in this case, they were able to conclude that the ball actually was in because we had multiple signals that we could draw from. Um, and similarly, in software, the same exact thing applies. So, but getting down into details as a developer, the kinds of questions you might want to ask yourself, is my software running? Is my program starting but not actually accepting requests? If something goes wrong, how do I get to the root cause of what went wrong? Um, my, if my application is running, why is it slow? Right, these are the kinds of things you might consider as a software developer uh, but having those multiple angles can open up the aperture of stakeholders to other folks, right? In the soccer example, it opens the aperture up to the fans and others and not just the officials. So it's really great to have those different angles um, in your telemetry solution. So the industry has made many different attempts to define what observability and what telemetry is. Um, one easy, sometimes controversial, but one easy way for someone who's new to observability 
is to kind of put the different types of signals into these three buckets, right? Metrics, logs, and traces. So metrics, are, you're probably familiar with. This is like how much memory is my, is my uh, program using? Logs are kind of a, a uh, immutable uh, list of things that occurred in the past, and then traces, in particular distributed traces in the, in the age of microservices, kind of traces the path of a single invocation or single request through the different services that it visits. Historically, in the world of you know, mainframes and monoliths, the signals were log files and stack traces, or in, that, in earlier cases, core dumps from the kernel. Um, and then you know, a, a, an SRE would take that and try, and try and figure out, based on that one snapshot, what happened. Imagine if they had you know, a full set of, of, of distributed traces and logs and a set of metrics leading up to a, an issue. It, it makes it a lot easier to figure out what went wrong. And there's, in fact, tools that can help you do that today. Uh, so one interesting aspect here is uh, logs and traces grow linearly with the number, with the request volume. So as you get, you know, twice the number of requests coming into a system, generally you're going to get twice the number of logs and traces because, you know, twice as many things are happening, unlike metrics, which are kind of dependent on how the metric is actually defined. It doesn't always scale linearly, but... Um, that's important to understand when you're designing an observability system because you can't not capture every single possible facet of every single you know, microsecond uh, in the world of your system because you would spend your time recording to a file for logs and not actually doing real work in the system. So you have to, there's some trade-offs there, and OpenTelemetry kind of makes some of that. In fact, a lot of the uh, prior art in the world of observability also recognize this same phenomenon. So how do you get these metrics, logs, and traces? Well, the, kind of the typical process is you instrument the code, you collect the data, put it somewhere, uh, you process that data, um, and then you draw conclusions or infer conclusions or, or draw visualizations to help humans understand this mountain of data, right? And traditional vendors, traditional APM vendors kind of cropped up, um, you know, probably many decades ago, um, as we started to build software, uh, uh, as you know, PCs became uh, popular and a lot more people started to build software, a lot more vendors popped up to try and attach, attack this problem, um, which is fantastic, right? You, you love to see um, advances in software, but the problem is they, of course, had their solution for instrumentation, their solution for data processing, their solution for storage, their solution for visualization sort of get locked in, right? And once you do that, it's really, really hard and very costly to switch. So that's sort of the, that traditional APM vendor um, offered that. And I can name names, but I won't. I'm sure you can think of several in, the, in this space. Um, and the reason we're here today is talking about open source. So as the state of the art advanced in software development, as we started to build distributed systems, more, more and more distributed systems, um, the cost of providing and keeping up with the state of the art became very high, becomes very high, and continues to rise. So these APM vendors decided we don't really we don't we don't really want to spend the resources competing with creating APIs. We want to spend resources competing on like visualizations and AI ops and you know sort of higher level uh, uh, concerns in the world of software and observability. And let's collaborate instead of uh, instead of silo the solutions. And so a number of of open source solutions became um, known and became, started to become developed in the early knots. Um, and so early instances, you, you've probably all heard of things like uh, Zipkin and Jaeger. Um, there's things even before that. Uh, Google started a project called Dapper. Um, and there's, there's many others that attempted to bring a solution, an open source solution uh, to the world of computing. So as a developer, right, how do you get started? If, you, if you're a new developer, you, you, you're new to observability and you want to add this to your program or add this to your container runtime or whatever you happen to be working on, right, the first thing you're going to do, go to CNCF and CNCF website and do a search for monitoring, logging, and tracing, and you'll get something like this, right? It's a little bit overwhelming. Um, there's lots of different solutions. That's the good and the bad part about open source, right? Anyone can develop a solution. They can get it listed on a quote-unquote marketplace. And now you're kind of faced with a number of somewhat competing, somewhat complementary solutions. So it's really challenging as a developer to understand how to get started. So, um, you know, one of the 
creators of the Dapper project um, recognized the same issue and, and said, yeah, we, you know, there's too many logging, or there's too many tracing standards. We need one standard. So they invented open tracing. So open tracing was great because it was the first attempt at kind of defining what a trace is. They were worried, working in the traces area, the distributed tracing area. So they define what a trace is, right? A trace is a directed acyclic graph of spans of work with different uh, metadata associated with each of those spans. And they created an API, um, which is fantastic for tracing. There's no metrics, there's no logging, just tracing, but it was, it was a fantastic attempt. Um, you may recognize this uh, cartoon, right? The, this is exactly what happened, right? They're like, there's 14 different standards. That's nonsense, we just need one. So let's create one. And then soon, there's now 15 new standards for tracing. So, you know, it was, it was another attempt, uh, a valiant attempt at that. At the same time, other vendors, um, like Google itself, was working on bringing additional functionality above and beyond just tracing. So they wanted to add uh, metrics. Um, they wanted to not only provide an API, but actually provide an SDK, right? A binary downloadable thing that you can use with your program. They wanted to also provide kind of full stack support. So not just instrumenting your code and emitting traces or metrics, but also collecting those metrics and storing them and processing them and providing uh, hooks for other vendors to do additional work on that data. So this was a, a kind of a, a, the next evolution of a observability, quote unquote, standard and open source, which is awesome. Um, but again, right, this is a different one. In some ways, complementary to something like open tracing. In some ways, it competes with open tracing. So they had, you know, a, a lot of overlap there. So the good news is they kind of got together and realized this together, and the two projects um, have merged. And actually, um, this year, uh, op the result, you, you, the result was released this year. But uh, this merge happened in, I think, 2019. Um, both of these projects were sort of EOL'd or, you know, slowed down or 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 deprecated in some way, and a new uh, project was born from that, which is called Open Telemetry, which is what we're here today to talk about. Um, open Telemetry essentially takes the best of both open tracing and open census and combines them into a full stack observability solution uh, for a number of different uh, programming languages and libraries and frameworks. Um, it, again, it, it, it's full stack, meaning there is a way for you to instrument your code. There's a way for you to collect and store the data. There's a way for you to analyze the data and draw some basic conclusions about that data. And it provides the ability for vendors like, I don't know, Datadog or SNCC or uh, a number of other ones to uh, compete in that higher level space. So it's, it's kind of a win-win for everyone. In fact, there are, I think there was last count, 800 different contributors from 150 different companies. If you go to the Open Telemetry website and look at the list of companies that are contributing, you'll see all those APM vendors, right? They all want to get out of the business of, of trying to maintain and, and track the state of the art in terms of how you uh, collect data and move into a higher level com competition uh, with each other. So instead, they're, con they're basically contributing back and, and, and you know, um, working with each other to develop and, and move the standard forward. So open telemetry brings both uh, metrics and logging and tracing. So all three of those observability pillars that I mentioned earlier are, are uh, represented in open telemetry. Uh, now the logging part is not quite finished yet. It should be hopefully go GA sometime early next year. Um, but it's a fantastic way for you to instrument your code and, you know, it does, as I said, metrics, logging, and tracing, and all of that data can be correlated with unamb unambiguous correlation. But like if you emit a log file as part of a method, it can immediately be automatically attached to a span and then a trace, and then the visualization tools can help you, you know, deep dive into a problem. If you're looking at a, at a trace that has some performance issue that you have, you can kind of double click and get down into the logs and get down into the metrics associated with that trace. So it's a really well thought through uh, solution um, and it's really powerful for, again, providing you with the ability to not define the questions up front, but to answer many, many, many different types of questions after the fact when something goes wrong or if you just want to understand the state of your system. 
So very powerful, and Daniel's going to show you a lot about how it works um, in a moment. I just wanted to point this out. So this is the uh, graph of, of contributions, PRs, commits um, on uh, CNCF projects. And as you can see at the upper right there, um, OpenTelemetry, almost as, as active as Kubernetes itself. And so this is you know, a testament to the power of open source and the power of communities coming together and vendors coming together to work together for a common solution. This benefits everyone in this room, I hope. Um, so yeah, so we hope to see that continue uh, going forward. Um, what OpenTelemetry is, as I said, it's a library with metrics, logs, and traces. It provides not only the specification, like what um, Open Tracing provided, but it also provides SDKs for, uh, in various languages for binding to your language. It defines what a binding even means, meaning the different you know, native types in a language, how those map to concepts uh, defined by open telemetry. It also defines an, uh, tr uh, a binary protocol for transmitting that data and collecting it and massaging it. And more importantly, it provides a way to uh, maintain compatibility with existing systems. So if you're using things like Jaeger or Zipkin or Dapper or, or any of the other common uh, solutions, um, then you'll be able to use OpenTelemetry with that because it has a way to collect that data in that native format, transform it to the OpenTelemetry format, and then store and process that later on. So very powerful um, collector there, the, the thing on the right, the Otel collector. It's sort of a Swiss Army knife of tools, and it's provided as part of that project. So you can not only use the standard protocol, but also the, um, the uh, the, the existing protocols that they may be using. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, so for Java, um, Java has a particularly challenging uh, point in time. Uh, as the cloud has matured, Java has been you know, traditionally thought of as heavyweight and slow, um, and so and not compatible, if you will, with like modern microservices. Um, and so we at Red Hat are doing a lot of work in this space, and Daniel's gonna kind of show you a solution for Java in, in the context of serverless, which is where that problem, the historical traditional Java, is really um, magnified. So I'll pass it over to Dan. Thank you so much, James. So it's a traditional way, like open telemetry or the other tracing tools. So you already figured out where is my application, the target environment to gather or collect your telemetry data or tracing data or log, et cetera. However, the serverless application is up and down any time based on your network traffic. So it's very hard to find out and then uh, collect your telemetry data. That's why I really more focus on how to, how to solve this kind of problem for developer. And then in the end, you can collect that uh, uh, insightful uh, telemetry data and logging, et cetera, on your infrastructure layer. So the Quarkus uh, is new Java framework, uh, just in case you never ever heard about that before. So it's a, a lot of people are actually uh, moving forward to JavaScript or Go uh, to use the serverless application on top of the image Lambda, for example, because Java is a pretty heavy way. It was born almost 27 years ago, and then it's a dynamic behavior. You can run Java application, any app server of the internet technology, which is super awesome at a time. However, things change. Everybody is doing Kubernetes just like you, and then your application container uh, up and down any time, and then killed, and then scale out like a 10,000, even million container anytime, any soon. In that case, Java, at the dynamic behavior, is a pretty much not good behavior in the container platform. So that's a lot of people just move away from Java technology. However, we cannot ignore that there are more than 16.5 million Java developers out there, and they're living in there, and then like a uh, develop business application services every single day. So Quarkus actually uh, gives some shiny thing for them, Java developer, uh, with the uh, bunch of the uh, like a performance uh, tuning, and then we change the, uh, the fundamental architecture, and then we give more like a developer productivity, uh, et cetera, here. So I'm gonna get right into the demo. I'll give you some more like uh, interesting stuff. I feel you got a little bit sleepy after good lunchy. So I'm gonna stop a boring slide deck 
And then here's my application. I already created my application this morning. It's pretty simple, just RESTful API. You can see that uh, just RESTful API, I could return endpoint uh, hello greeting, and uh, welcome Cube Day Japan 2022. And the other is uh, uh, let's endpoint, like uh, just hotel, open telemetry, and then my session title. And let's try to, I'm gonna run uh, my local environment just to make sure my application running and then working on my local environment and then how to get that done. And I'm gonna just stop it. So I'm gonna try to run uh, my local uh, logging infrastructure, which is the uh, uh, Jaeger and uh, Open Telemetry. In order to that, I most likely want to use uh, like a container runtime, like a like a Docker. So here's my Docker Compose file. Pretty simple. As here's the Jaeger. I'm gonna just run my Jaeger image. And here's the Open Telemetry collector image, and then like a backend port here, which is to connect to uh, like a gathering message in the back and send it back to Jaeger server. So in order to run in that, I'm going to run Docker Compose menu, uh, command line, and then it just pop up instantly. Let's try to see. It's running. Okay, I have a two container process here, open telemetry and Jaeger, and now I'm going to run my application, you can job by application. Once it runs this application, it automatically connects to open telemetry. Because when I go back to my project, and then here's my key and value properties. As you can see, I'm gonna make it a little bit zoom in. Here we go. And here's my application uh, name services, which is identify in the Jaeger server. Here's my open telemetry explorer, uh, which is here, the open telemetry and the port name, which I did, I, I just run in Docker container. And uh, this is all I, I need to do. However, actually using Quarkus, you don't, you can skip this kind of configuration by default because it's uh, just default configuration. But I want to showcase uh, more obviously uh, what kind of configuration you need to set it in your application side to connect to open telemetry. So now I'm going, going to uh, the uh, your uh, browser and then open to the Jaeger web UI. And so as you can see, there's a, the default Jaeger and then there's no metric data, tracing data at this moment. And I'm going back to terminal window, and the, the empty terminal window. Let's try to access one of the endpoint. Hello, greeting. And now you can see the welcome cube day uh, just like a Japan 2020, I might put my name then. And I'm gonna reload the, the Jaeger UI. Now you can see the new service came out. Just, uh, just uh, collect your data. And then it's uh, not just directly Jaeger, it's open telemetry actually grab the data and collect the telemetry data and then send it back to Jaeger. And then now you can see, uh, check it out, your Jaeger. You can actually print in the Jaeger Jeepkin server or the other uh, like a tracing server, just like uh, James mentioned earlier. And then click on tracing, you can have a one tracing data here, you can find more detail. If you have already uh, some experience to use the tr uh, Jaeger before, and then you're familiar with the how to use that. And then if you want to uh, call one more time, and then you have a, now two trace is now. And then you, let's try to the other open telemetry uh, let's put API and then just distributed uh, tracing integrating with the Quarkus, KNAV, and Hotel. And then now you can see, I'm gonna reload the web page once again, and now you can see the other endpoint here. So hello, Hotel. And you click on Hotel, and then find trace, now you can have a one. So I just, I really quick uh, verify my application, how to connect to my Java application into Hotel, open telemetry, and then back to the Jaeger, which is pretty simple. My application pretty simple, like a just a RESTful API. I just need three key and values, which allows me to use open telemetry and uh, put together all tracing data into Jaeger server. Now I'm gonna deploy this application into production, which is a Kubernetes as a server less based on Knative. Because sometimes I don't, I don't want to my application running all the time and save my money in infrastructure layer. So you know to that, uh, the Quarkus actually provide one great feature here uh, OpenShift extension, which uh, allows me to uh, skip a lot of steps manually. So 
wants to my, let's try to uh, run my application first. So I'm going to stop my local runtime and then just to build my application. And then behind the scene, it tried to package an application like a Java art, the artifact like a Java file and then containerize the image and then that uh, try to push that image into like a container registry. In this case, I'm going to use integrate container registry inside the Kubernetes, which is your OpenShift cluster Red Hat. And then uh, finally, uh, it will deploy to uh, K native service on top of the Kubernetes. But in the developer standpoint, I just need to run one single command line and the other stuff and task are automatically happening. What happened when I go back to my project in the target directory, <coughs> excuse me, there are Kubernetes directory, it can find the YAML file for KNAB services, and then a Kubernetes and OpenShift stuff. And then uh, it, once it deploy, and then when I go to my OpenShift cluster, which is based on Kubernetes. So I already uh, installed Jaeger and the open telemetry using an uh, operator. So when you click on the uh, web UI, this is not local anymore. This is a cloud on Kubernetes. And then uh, there's no trace at this moment, just the brand new. As you can see, just uh, Jaeger query, the default thing, there's no services here. And then now, in the meantime, my application deploy as KNAB services here. And then it will coming up soon. And then once it coming up soon, and this is just running, uh, just uh, the, looks like it's a normal part. And then back to the here, and then your application running one part here. And then it will scale down to zero as long as you don't have any natural incoming traffic uh, for the next uh, 30 seconds, which is a default computation in scale to down zero in the uh, K-native uh, K project. So let's give us a moment. And then once it just down, and then we're going to just invoke the REST API based on this fully defined uh, domain name. And then, and then we're going to see uh, it automatically uh, uh, collect the telemetry data from our open telemetry and Jaeger. And what happened in there, I'm going to showcase uh, what kind of computation I actually set it up. So for example, go to, uh, let me try to change the admin console and then operator and then KNAB serving. And here is the KNAB serving. I already created the CR. And then once you go to detail YAML file, and then I already set it up. I'm going to make it bigger. Set it up here, the backend uh, GK, which is actually point to our running Jaeger part. And then it, this is a KNAB serving already connect to my backend Jaeger server. And, uh, and then back to the open telemetry. Uh, by the namespace, here it's open telemetry collector CR, and then go to here hotel and the YAML file, and now you can see the inner in in here is the uh, receiver and the exporter and the Jaeger server. So this is how to make it happen. Uh, when you uh, deploy serverless applications in K-native, and it automatically connect to uh, the hotel. And then hotel grab the, the telemetry data and send it back to Jaeger server. You don't need to worry about how to uh, uh, communicate in the up and down the serverless application, like it's an agent based, because the serverless anytime up and down, you don't know when actually down and up. It's randomly uh, based on your network traffic. And let's go back to topology view and then uh, take a look at that. Our application actually scaled down to zero. There's no part anymore. So let's go back to my local environment and then try to access endpoint. Hello and greeting. And then I just invoked my REST API and now you can see the part is just going up just like a serverless lambda, like an Amazon lambda, just like a serverless behavior. And then in the meantime, uh, let's go to Jaeger UI, and I'm going to reload that. 
and they, when you, you load the Jaeger UI, and it will, new services pop up based on your serverless deployment name. So here is our serverless name, it's already detected automatically. And then when you create the find traces, and then you can find the, uh, the hello, the greeting uh, endpoint, if you want to uh, invoke several more time. And then you can find the more traces here. And you can also uh, call deeper on uh, the last API and the reload the, the uh, Jaeger UI, and you can find a new uh, operation and just create it here under the, the, the same services. And then when you go down, uh, your uh, serverless function is go down and it just go up based on the new network traffic, you can find a new service automatically uh, created in the Jaeger UI. So that's the uh, pretty easy way to how to uh, uh, build up your open telemetry as well as the serverless application based on the Java, uh, uh, running on your Java Quarkus framework, and then I'm, I'm going to use the backend, the Jaeger server. But you can have add more like a, a polygonal language runtime, like maybe uh, the Rust and the Python and whatever you know, JavaScript. But always the challenge for developer to figure it out, just James, James mentioned earlier, so SDK API and then what kind of things you need to use uh, for integrate this kind of stack for your serverless application on top of the Kubernetes. Okay, uh, that's all I have today, James and I. Here's a one, my like a YouTube channel. Yeah, you can feel free to subscribe. I already put in the, the similar video and the tutorial and a bunch of stuff. And we are more than happy to address a question if you have any uh, question on there. There we go, yeah. Can you pass okay. my mic over there? Thank you for the presentation. Uh, one, one question about the uh, 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 traces. So uh, uh, let, let's say like uh, we have some uh, uh, health checks uh, generating a lot of uh, API calls. So uh, how would you uh, filter those out or uh, make it so that uh, we, not, we don't uh, generate uh, traces for uh, such uh, 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 unnecessary uh, API calls? Yeah, there's, so there's a number of different ways to do it. You can do it in the application, of course. Um, if you're looking at like a health pro from Kubernetes, you can also filter those out uh, through the open telemetry collector configuration. <coughs> um, yeah, you did. You probably did see the, the probe uh, service there um, in the trace that Daniel showed. So yeah, you can filter those out in the uh, open telemetry collector configuration. Um, or if you're using something like service mesh, um, like uh, um, you can also eliminate those um, endpoints from being uh, emitted as a trace or emitted as part of a trace. So it's a number of different configuration layers. You can eliminate those. So, so it would be uh, in the uh, collector's side uh, or, or is it possible to configure also at the, uh, uh, for example, in Java, like we can use the uh, auto instrumentation library, like uh, can we configure it that, that side also? Yes, you can, absolutely. Yep. Oh. Thank you. Okay. okay, I think we're out of time. Um, yeah. no. If you have any other questions, we'll be around afterwards. Yeah, we're gonna stay around the hallway. You can just feel free to reach out to ask any question. We are more than happy to address. Thanks for joining today. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>